Well, thank you. That was a good start. Um, uh, well, as I said, I'm, I'm going to talk about what we did, uh, why we did it, and, and, and how we did it. Good, good kind of basic talk outline there. So when we started uh, AWS Lambda, it's a function as a service offering uh, about uh, 2015, uh, we supported one way of, of deploying code, or kind of two ways of deploying code into Lambda, uh, and that is to bring a, a zip file or a kind of raw code file uh, to the platform. Uh, we started off supporting up to 50 megabytes of, of code, a 50 megabyte zip file. We raised that to 250 megabytes a couple of months after launch. Um, and what's cool about this is it's really easy, and you can just kind of type some code into the console. You can send us a Python file with as little as two lines of code, and we will run it as a Lambda function. Um, but it was also restrictive for reasons I'll talk about in a second. And so this work describes how we took that 250 megabyte limit, we raised it to 10 gigabytes, so that's a 40x increase. Um, how we incre uh, extended the support from, from these kind of code files or zip files to standard container images, so Docker-style container images, uh, and, uh, and how that allows customers to use these sort of standard container toolkit or tool chain uh, to create uh, the artifacts they're going to deploy in Lambda. And the real challenge here is that we needed to do all of this without increasing cold starts. And so what we mean when we say cold starts um, is, uh, is the extra latency that folks see when they run a function for the first time or when we scale up a function on their behalf. This is probably the, most, the single most important performance metric that our customers uh, worry about. Um, and... Uh, and, and so, you know, we needed to increase this, this package size by 40x without increasing cold starts. And that's a real challenge, uh, primarily because, um, primarily because uh, downloading packages is one of the big contributors to cold starts. And, and in a lot of cases is the dominant contributor to cold starts. And so, you know, increasing that package size by 40x without making the cold starts 40x longer uh, was, uh, was something of a challenge and, and, and a big reason why we hadn't done this yet. So let's talk about why, you know, why we wanted to do this. Uh, so when we launched Lambda, we heard a lot of customers who were very happy with the way that we uh, asked them to deploy code. They told us it was, it was simple. Uh, they told us it was easy to bring their code. It's just a couple of lines. I can type it in the console. I can download it. Um, they told us it was really fast to sort of bring these things in. Um, and that was great. Uh, you know, great, great to get that kind of customer feedback. But over time, as people tried to bring a broader range of applications to serverless, uh, tried to migrate in existing applications and had a lot of success with that, the nature of the customer feedback changed. People were telling us that it was complicated to write their own tools to build these zip files, that it was difficult to slim down their applications to fit into to a 250 megabyte zip file that it was complex dealing with the trade-off between cold start time and deployed artifact size. And so nothing about the product had changed, but because the customer mix had changed, uh, the requirements became quite different and the feedback became quite different. And so we wanted to enable a whole new set of customers to bring their artifacts to Lambda in a different way. The other thing we started hearing more and more from customers uh, in, in Lambda was saying, you know, it's fantastic that you do all of this management stuff for us where you patch the runtime and you patch the operating system. That really simplifies things, uh, but we don't want you to do it, right? We want to be able to take our uh, code, our libraries, our runtimes, and the rest of the user land, we want to package those up and we want to integration test those. And so we don't want the first time that a certain bit is or set of bits are running together to be in production, which is the, the case with the old Lambda model. We want to bring that earlier in our pipeline uh, to integration time so we can run our tests. You know, very common enterprise pattern. And then the third reason we did this work is if we just take the kind of package size increase and we multiply it by the number of cold starts we do, we would need 150 petabytes, petabits a second of bandwidth to move all that data around. I don't know about you all, but I don't have 150 petabits a second of spare network capacity lying around. And if I did, I would certainly find something more cool to do it than you know, ship millions of copies of the JVM around every second. So what did we do? 
Um, we bought, built a pipeline where customers bring their container image. They put it into a standard container registry, for example, Amazon ECR. Um, so this is a kind of standard container component. They created that container image with tools like Docker. They upload it to the container component, and then they call us to register it. We then take that container, and all a container is, if you've never looked inside it, is a kind of stack of tar files. We, uh, we flatten down that stack of tar files in a deterministic way, which is very important. Um, and then we take the resulting block device from flattening down those tar files. We chunk it up into chunks. We calculate a, uh, well, we encrypt the chunks. We calculate a hash of the chunks. And then we start, we put them into S3 where the hash of the chunks is kind of a, a key to the content. And so we're kind of using S3 here as a content addressable store. So we've taken each of these container images and we've broken it down and made it into, um, into a whole bunch of, of chunks. And if a customer, and even the same customer or a different customer comes along with a operating, um, with a container image that has a lot of the same stuff in it, will end up with a lot of the same chunks and so won't go into S3. And so there's this kind of deduplication step, which I'll talk about some more. Then when cold start happens, the Lambda worker, which is this kind of machine that runs the micro VMs that, uh, that run the Lambda functions, uh, will pull the content it needs uh, from that content addressable store. Um, it will cache them locally for some amount of time and it will put them up into a distributed uh, chunk cache. Let's zoom in a little bit on that worker. Um, so the standard Lambda architecture uh, that we've had for, for about, about five years now is we have a Firecracker micro VM, and so this is a, this is a KVM-based micro, um, like micro virtual machine uh, using our Firecracker VMM. Um, and, uh, and so that was unchanged. And then we plugged into Firecracker this local agent that pre presents these, uh, these chunked up uh, container images to Firecracker as a block device. And in turn, Firecracker presents those, that block device, to the, uh, to the guest as this fiction, right? It is an empty device, but when the customer comes and reads a byte from it, suddenly the bytes that back the area they're reading will get loaded on demand, um, put onto the device, and their, their read will return. And so in this way, we're able to do all kinds of sort of data plane storage stuff without any change to applications. From the application's perspective, this is a fully downloaded, unpacked copy of their container image. So let's step into each of these, the, the kind of parts of, of that solution. Um, we've got on-demand loading. Uh, so that is the when a container comes along and tries to load a piece. We get it at that time on demand. We have our caching layer, which is built with consistent hashing, deduplication, convergent encryption, erasure coding, and a number of tiers. And I'm going to go through each of these in turn. And then we have that layer that I just talked about that presents all of this stuff transparently to applications. First, let's talk about on-demand loading. Um, so there's this uh, great paper from FAST16 uh, where um, Harter found that uh, container applications on average only load 6.4% of the data in their containers at startup time. And so if you're thinking, well, if you know, people are packaging up their applications in containers and loading less than 10% of the data, does this mean that containers are a really bad packaging format for software from an efficiency perspective? And if you're thinking that, you're absolutely right. But they're also a really good uh, packaging format from a compatibility and convenience perspective. Um, and so we don't know how to balance those things yet, but right now, uh, lazy loading allows us to accelerate container loading by something like 15x. Our, our, our numbers are fairly similar here. And then deduplication. So in the container ecosystem, uh, a lot of folks will start with a base Linux image that could be, uh, could be Alpine, it could be Ubuntu, it could be Amazon Linux, and almost everybody uses a relatively small set of those base images. And then on top of that, they put a relatively small set of runtime images with the JVM or with Python and so on. And so this means that container images are largely the same across 
lots of customers across lots of applications. And in fact, what we see is that about of the containers uploaded to Lambda, about 80% of them are bit for bit identical to a container that we've seen in the past. And then of that 20%, about 75% of, of the chunks of that, you know, we, we broke that down into sort of bitwise chunks, are a chunk that we've seen before. And so there's this huge deduplication effect here. Only about 5% of 20%, I don't know if this makes sense, only about 5% of 20%, so only about 1% of the total data in the system per container is actually new and unique at the time the customer uploads the container. And so there's this huge, almost 100x benefit we get from being able to deduplicate container images because there's so little uniqueness in each one. Also, as a systems person, might make you wonder about the efficiency of containers, um, but that is the way they are. But, you know, deduplication's great, great for efficiency. Too much deduplication um, is, uh, causes uh, blast radius concerns. Uh, and so what I mean by that is you can imagine that there is a chunk uh, of, you know, the first little bit of the Alpine Linux user land, which is used by a large number of customers, a large number of containers, almost everybody. And so if something bad happened to that chunk, for some reason we lost it because of a bug, or we lost it because of some correlated hardware failure, almost everybody would have a bad time. And so that's what we mean by blast radius. And so when we deduplicate, we try not to deduplicate too well. We mix a little bit of salt into our deduplication hash function to make sure that there is no chunk in the system that fans out to too many different places, to too many different customers. And so this is quite different from the way that a lot of uh, systems think about deduplication, where more is always better. More is definitely better from an um, efficiency perspective, but not necessarily better from an operations and reliability perspective. I mentioned we use uh, this technique called convergent encryption. So convergent encryption is a way for us to take these chunks of data and encrypt them in a way that still allows us to deduplicate. Um, and so if you just take a chunk of data and you encrypt it with a standard thing like AES-GCM, you're going to have a random IV, you're probably going to have a unique key, and so you'll get different bits every time. And that is by design. It's good stuff. Cryptographers love that kind of thing. But it makes deduplication impossible. And so we use this technique called convergent encryption where we actually derive a key from the content of the chunk um, and then use that key to encrypt the chunk which means the same bits encrypt in the same way every time, but there's no way to decrypt them unless you know what the bits are already. It's a very, very cool technique. And convergent encryption allows us to minimize trust in the system. The part of the system that is flattening uh, those containers uh, and breaking them up doesn't have to be trusted by anybody. It creates these chunks. Um, it uses this encryption approach to, to encrypt them. It uses a HMAC to, to derive their content key. It puts them up in the store. And it can do that in a way that even if some arbitrarily bad code runs on that worker, uh, that code can't inject, uh, it can't inject in change, sorry, <laughs> can't change existing chunks. It can't inject evil chunks. Uh, and so on in the system. And so this allows us to uh, not trust that unpacking worker, and it allows us to only trust the worker that is running the functions with the keys for the functions that it's running. And so there is no kind of master key in the system that says, well, now you can access every little bit of data, which is a really nice property, again, from a end-to-end uh, -end security perspective. The other component of our design is based on consistent hashing. Uh, this is a really classic sort of approach uh, often used in databases. This diagram comes from the Amazon Lambda paper from SOSP07. Um, and the idea here is you take the name of something that you want to put into a cache. Um, you map that name into a, into a kind of ring. And so you sort of um, use a consistent hash function um, that will pick a point in a you know, like a two to the 32 size space, and then you walk around that space and you choose a, choose a set of hosts. And in the classic database design, uh, what you will do is you will upload to 
the first three hosts who kind of come along as you go through this, uh, through this ring of hosts. So, you know, very classic way of doing a distributed cache. Um, and it's really nice because it is, uh, it's fault tolerant. Uh, there's some nice bounds on how much data you have to move as you scale up or scale down that cache. And so this is a very cool classic technique. Unlike the normal technique, though, we don't replicate data in the cache. Uh, we use an erasure code uh, to place uh, parts of each chunk on multiple servers in the cache. And so we take a chunk and we break it up into five pieces, uh, of which we can reconstruct it from any four of the five. Uh, this has some really nice properties. Uh, the property that it is most well known for, I think, in the caching context, is that it has a fantastic effect on tail latency. And what that means is we go out to five servers, we say, uh, give me your piece of the chunk, and when the first four of them come back, we can put those together. And so that means if there is one slow or transiently overloaded server or one with a bad nick or whatever, we completely reject the tail latency that that would have injected into the system in a classic kind of replicated um, or unreplicated uh, cache. And so you can see the result here. Uh, the red line is, is with erasure coding. Um, and the teal line is uh, uh, with uh, just kind of parallel fetch of, of multiples. And you can see that in the red line, we really sort of flatten out. You know, we hit 100%. We flatten out that tail latency way early. Um, the other nice effect of erasure coding is we save a bunch of cost compared to replication. And so to get uh, uh, the same kind of durability and the same kind of operational properties that we would get with our four of five code, we would need to do three replication. And so instead of having three copies of every chunk in the cache, we can have 1.25 copies in the cache. And so that's a more than 2x saving of cache space to get the same level of resilience to host failure, to deployments of these services, and so on. And so erasure coding is this really nice kind of very simple to implement. This is literally like about 10 lines of code in our system, plus a little bit of logic to do read repair, um, that adds a huge amount of resilience at very little cost, 25% increase in cost. And then I talked about tiered caches, and, and here the tiers are the L1, which is our local cache on the worker, um, L2, which is our data center level distributed cache, uh, and then L3, which is S3. I should have called it S3 instead of L3. Um, and so about 65% uh, about of our chunks we load come from that local cache, and what's cool about that is it's in memory on the worker. This takes uh, you know, hundreds of microseconds to load these, sorry, hundreds of nanoseconds to load these things. Um, and then most of the remainder comes from that data center level cache. This happens in hundreds of microseconds uh, with really nice tail latency properties and slightly less than or significantly less than 1% of all chunks are loaded from the origin where the origin is, is S3 and that takes, uh, you know, tens of milliseconds. And so with a relatively modest size local cache and, um, and, and distributed cache, uh, we get some very, very high hit rates. And that is because of the strength of deduplication and how much of container images is not unique between applications. So I was super excited to share this work with this community. Um, you know, because as you can see, what we built here is a composition of tools and techniques that have been developed by the people in this community over decades of systems work. I think it's super exciting to have a toolkit uh, that we can put together applications, uh, you know, solve customer problems with those tools. Um, and so I, you know, I wanted to share the details of that. I'm also just super excited about serverless because I think serverless gives us a really cool way of taking those techniques and giving them to a set of customers, to a set of people, to a set of developers who don't understand them, who don't even know they exist necessarily, but can get the power out of those techniques because we can build them into a serverless platform and abstract away all of the magic that we're doing under the covers, and I think that's super cool. So what are we doing in future? Well, we're thinking about alternatives to containers. Um, containers are great. They've been super successful for really good reasons. Um, but from an efficiency perspective, it's just a terrible way to package software. Um, you know, lift up a whole Linux user land of which you're going to use about 5%. 
uh, you know, lift up a whole JVM of which you're going to use maybe 10%, package that all up, move it over the wire, and then get us to do all of this bending over backwards to make sure that it is efficiently on your machine, well, it all is just a whole lot of inefficiency. For good reason, but it would be nice to make it go away. I had some great conversations last night at the poster session with folks thinking about things like WebAssembly. I think there's a really interesting path with those kinds of technologies to have better ways of packaging serverless applications that are almost as flexible and powerful as containers, but orders of magnitude more efficient from a deployment perspective. Uh, we're thinking more and more about tools for understanding emergent systems behavior. And so one of the things that worries us running the cloud at scale is what happens when that cache is suddenly empty? If there's a bug, if uh, you know, things expire, if things get lost from the cache, we have to hit that origin suddenly a hundred times more often. What happens if that L1 stops working and we have to hit the distributed cache a hundred times more often? What happens if deduplication stops working for, for some reason, like a change in, in customer behavior? And we want to be able to build, and we are investing in building, tools for reasoning about the behavior of systems when those things change, avoiding the metastable failure states, uh, both with formal reasoning and control theory like mathematics. Um, I think it's a really interesting area of work and I'd love to see more of that uh, from the community as a whole. We're continuing to work on uh, support for virtualization um, and uh, making it easier to tell these kind of lies to guests about uh, what their storage devices actually are. And then finally, about, uh, about six months ago, we launched something called Lambda Snapstart, which does all of this caching and distribution stuff, but with memory. And so you start up, you do a cold start, you start the JVM, you start running, you warm it up, and then you snapshot the memory, and you distribute it through this distribution plane to make lots and lots and lots of distributed clones for that. And in that way, we've taken about 90% of the cold start time for a lot of uh, Java applications, especially. Um, and so we're going to talk more about how we did that. Uh, but the fundamental data plane of Snapstart is a lot like this. And we're continuing to invest in Snapstart, making that mechanism more, um, you know, more general and more powerful. Thank you. <laughs>